on the bench today is something a little bit different. Today we're going to review John Gaydon's new New South Wales Government Railways Locomotives in Action book called Smoke. So stay tuned. <laughs> So you're probably wondering why we're going to review this book. Well, I think that these books that John Gaydon produces, this is not the only one that he does. He also did Northern Exposures. He's also done uh, Shooting the West. Um, these books have been invaluable to me in building my representation of the main south of the New South Wales Government Railways in the period of somewhere from the late 50s through until the 80s or 90s. Without these books, uh, it would be very difficult uh, to be able to do the kind of modelling that I've been able to achieve. And uh, first up, I'd like to really thank John and his contributors for producing a book like this, because the reality is, is that this covers a moment in time when things were, uh, things were a lot, lot different. And the reality is that Without these records, we would not be able to model these kind of periods. So let's go through the book and uh, see what we think. It's got a really nice uh, forward uh, over here from uh, Laurie Anderson. Um, comes comes with uh, you know, some explanations um, you know, and uh, information about the book and some of the other options to uh, some ordering pages. And I think that there's still some in stock. So yeah, if you're still looking for some books, um, you know, consider going over to John's site and uh, having a look. But uh, the first part of the book uh, is broken up into uh, black and white photographs. And black and white's quite good because, um, you know, it brings out the detail in locomotives. So, you know, when you're doing detailing, um, you know, locomotives, you know, you can get to see all the fine, fine detail. And uh, for me, uh, how important these books have been to establishing a a period where, you know, I was really just growing up. You know, I went on a lot of steam tours with my dad, uh, lots of New South Wales Rail Transport Museum tours, you know, the final run of 3827, you know, triple-headed 38s to Moss Vale, all sorts of tours. But, you know, you're a little kid, you know, and you're taking in the, the ambience of the steam engines or whatever, you know, while I've got photographs from that era, you know, I haven't got a lot because photography in those days was really, really expensive. So... Yeah, you know, a lot of photographers shot in black and white, you know, and so what John's done in this book is he split it up into years, you know, the 30s, um, you know, and the 40s, and, you know, just flipping through here, you know, they are magnificent photographs of a simpler time when the New South Wales Railways had a strong arterial rail network around New South Wales, and you know, this was the main form of ways that people got around. You know, this is before, you know, Sydney to Newcastle Expressways and, uh, you know, Hume Highways or whatever. You know, they were just, you know, two-lane roads. So, you know, for getting freight around and for uh, getting passengers around, you know, the New South Wales Government Railways was, uh, you know, where it pretty well all started. And obviously it happened in other states as well. But, you know, New South Wales obviously had a fairly clearly defined arterial structure, you know, with major arteries leaving Central Station heading north, west and south. And of course, I'm trying to model the southern region uh, as best I can. So these books particularly um, make it a lot easier for detail. So, you know, the, the, the first part of the book is, uh, you know, all black and white, um, you know, and you get some ideas of um, how the locomotives actually appeared. And you'll see in the colour section coming up is that locomotives... Uh, in running condition in New South Wales were just not clean. And I think that probably even tour locomotives were not what you would call, say, British Railways um, uh, cleanliness. They were certainly, they were utilitarian engines, they were designed to do a job, and the rolling stock and the locomotives themselves were, uh, frankly, pretty grotty in reality. But... That's the patina of the locomotives that we're trying to model these days. So, you know, it takes a fair bit of work to uh, model locomotives, particularly Garrett's. Garrett's were so dirty that often you could hardly read their numbers. 
Um, you know, and I've done that with a couple of mine. You know, I've weathered them and weathered them and weathered them to the point where they're probably nearly half an inch thicker than they used to be. But um, you can see here, um, locomotives, you know, particularly around the pistons, around the tops of the boilers, you know, would get this whitish, light grey, you know, covering, which was probably the, you know, the the materials leaching out of the water. Um, you know, not the you know locomotive boilers weren't always treated as well as they possibly could be, and the, and water contaminants would stain the sides of boilers and would stain the sides of piston uh, piston housings, uh, you know, and smoke boxes as well. And of course, the wheel sets were just uh, pretty pretty dirty as well. So, um, of course, we all think of 3801 in its uh, beautiful, rich uh, tapestry of greens that it's been over the years, from special green to uh, Dulux green to verdant green, all the other greens that it's been. But um, the rest of the class, a couple of them were green, but the vast majority of them were, you know, dirt, dirty, murky black. Uh, you know, it wasn't that important. But, uh, you know, a special locomotive of the time, 3616, with its Giesel injector on the top here, recorded, uh, um, you know, just uh, just near Wyong. Um, you know, a popular model, if you can get one, in Oz trains. Um, they're the only manufacturer that ever made one, so, you know, they rarely pop up, but, you know, occasionally they do. Of course, my favourites are 38s, 36s and Garrett's. Um, so, you know, for the modeller, um, you know, you get to see some of the consists, and... Not only where these books are really handy is in the context of the loads in which the locomotives pulled. And I mean, you can see here a Garrett here with a whole row of S trucks and a you know, van at the back, and you know, with a uh, with a loco giving it uh, some some assistance at the back on Chimala Bank. You know, so um, how these guys did this, I don't know. Given that they had. Um, uh, you know, they didn't have walkie-talkies or whatever. They just did it by the feel of the throttle. And, uh, you know, that's a, that's a real talent now that probably, um, probably doesn't really um, you know, exist so much. So, um, you know, getting some ideas here, again, uh, from, you know, consists, you know, you can see here, you know, S-Class wagons covered. You know, then there'll be a CW van and there's some more S-trucks and then, you know, a few other trucks, you know, a couple of Louver vans, Looks like a couple of BCHs on the back here and then a guards van. And of course, that was back in the days when, when trains had guards vans. You know, now, of course, um, you know, you've got consists all over New South Wales without a guards van. To me, that looks a little bit untidy. But John and his crew here and his good friends, you know, uh, you know out in their cars all over the countryside in the, in the mid-60s and 70s, what a fabulous time it would have been, you know, for the young model, uh, sorry, for the young enthusiast trying to capture, um, you know, the, the last days of steam. And um, we're so appreciative as modelers that these guys did this because, you know, without this, you know, you, 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 know, you find it difficult to reference. You know, in my case, you know, I've built a turntable and uh, these light fittings here, uh, Andlin Models now makes these particular light fittings. You know, I'll just zoom in there so you can see it a little bit, you know, so... Yeah, you know, they're a long, uh, they're a long pole with a light on the top. Now I've got some of these around my turntable, but without reference guides like this, you know, it's very, very difficult to uh, set the scene. Now, you know, they've got, um, you know, this uh, uh, gantry over the top of this one here. Um, you know, so then of course we move into the colour section of the book. You know, so I'll just uh, zoom back a little bit so you can see. You know, the quali quality of these photographs is beautiful. You know, these are the old Camden line. Uh, you know, I can remember going on the, I think I think it was the last tour of the Camden line. But, you know, it's interesting, um, you know, getting back to Consys is that, you know, you get to see uh, some of the pairings, you know, you've got here, uh, you know, twin, uh, uh, twin looks like twin 36s here, you know, you get a 38 and a 36 together, something you, you, you may not do on your own layer, but, um, you know, certainly you can work out Consys from that. So just turning the pages turning the pages here. You can see here, um, you know, point rotting, uh, you know, which is, can, can be modelled these days, you know, interesting uh, platform pieces, you know, the old scales, uh, you know, on platforms as well. So, uh, you know, we'll just flip through here. Um, we can see, you know, Garrett's on the flyer, 
um, you know, and and the guys have been able to pick up some detail uh, as well. Some some beautiful steam shots here, you know, uh, double headed Garrett's, um, you know, uh, at Hawk Mount. I mean, what more could a a young boy uh, out taking photographs uh, want? So I want to take you back to that period. I, at that at that time, I was, um, you know, obviously I was just finishing school and I'd moved into the photographic industry, selling selling cameras and uh, getting photos processed for people and whatever. And cameras were expensive, uh, you know, in comparison to today. Uh, you know, a good single lens reflex camera were, was in the two hundred and fifty to three hundred dollars. A roll of Kodachrome film was about eighteen dollars. Um, and uh, sorry, a roll of ectochrome film was about eighteen dollars, and then it would cost about fifteen or twenty dollars to process. If you bought Kodachrome slides, they were twenty-four to thirty-five dollars for a roll. So every photograph that you took, you had to make make them count. You know, rolls had either twenty-four or thirty-six exposures, and it was important that you got your framing right and that you got the context right because every exposure cost you a couple of dollars and when you know you're a you're a young kid or you know just starting off in work you know when wages were like 50 or 60 dollars a week you know it it wasn't unheard of to spend half your wages on a couple of rolls of film photographs like this here you know with a train on this beautiful trestle bridge bring back scenes that uh you know were, were quite memorable from tours out to places like richmond uh, you know, and down south as well. So, you know, what do you do? A friend of mine has helped me uh, build, you know, put put this bridge together. Um, it's going to be uh, part of a potential extension of the layout here. Yeah, you know, and it's a very similar build. It's just waiting. You know, I'm just waiting to put some pieces along the side. But you know, it's photographs like this that help you actually model the real thing. So I'll just, I'll just put that back up out of the way there as as a bit of a reference. The real challenge of photography in uh, in the older days was exposure. Um, films were slow. Um, black and white films you could get up to 400 ASA. Um, colour films um, really capped out at about 200 ASA. So not like today with an iPhone or a camera phone, you'd be able to take a photograph like this with an iPhone, just stand there, press the button and you'd probably get a very, very good photograph. But in these days, you would have had to lug around a tripod, set up the camera gear, um, and then uh, try and get a, a really good exposure. And of course, you wouldn't know the result, of course, until about 10 days later or a week later when the processing came back. And these guys, um, you know, David Shield here, um, you know, and Graham Cottrell, you know, have, have been able to capture that evening essence of New South Wales locos uh you know at rest um you know with steam coming out you know this shows a, a moderate time exposure but again a lot of effort would have had to go to be able to take photographs like this just want to highlight this photograph here it's interesting to see just how close to the track um, some station buildings were but when you're trying to super detail a layout it's this kind of detail that you're trying to reproduce in this case um, there's a walkway across the track and you can see that look they've looked like they've used old sleepers um, and there's a variety of other pieces around you know there's signboards up the road there's these little um, uh, timber features along here I'm not sure exactly what some of these things do but when you're modeling it's this kind of detail that really adds to the realism and something that's also uh, I found that really is handy when you're modeling is actually go to the place that you're going to model and take some close up, take some close up photographs of detail like this. And I did this. I did this uh, you know, on the track just south of Goulburn when I was modeling um, the Kingsview layout here. And I reproduced the color of the ballast um, pretty well as it is in reality. Now, of course, it's difficult to do that for a period back in the back in the 50s or 60s and of course the ballast today is actually lighter because it doesn't have the coal staining and you know the steam staining that it has today a lot of the ballast today is a lot grayer than it used to be in the old days um, you know it was it was it probably went down gray but it ends up to be a murky dark murky murky brown color and what I've done um, you know with a mate of mine we've had that color reproduced um, into a into a car spray which has got a high content of pigment and when you spray the track 
and spray the sleepers and whatever, it comes out very, very realistic. Composition is everything when the subject really is just a locomotive or a train going past. And um, what um, Graham Cottrell has done here is he's used a uh, water crane as um, a framing piece to get a very nice photograph of this 19 class with some um, small hoppers going, uh, um, looks like maybe up to a coal stage. You know, that framing has been, is really, really good. In this case over here, we see the framing here. I'll just zoom in a little bit. There we go. Framing here is using a bit of the city skyline in the background. And this one's called a typical isometric view. But the importance of framing today seems to be lost on our young trained photographers because they get out there with their mobile phones. I'll just grab mine, you know, and uh, I'll just uh, show you. Yeah. They're out there and they take all their photographs in this format called vertical format. They're there, they're standing there. They take photographs in this. You see them all the time on all the train formats. Now, the problem is, is that when you take things in vertical format, what you actually do is compress the, photograph, the, the subject by about three times. So in this case, if I look at this subject here, if this was a real subject, I'd have to stand right back up here to get the, to get the subject in. The reality is, is that when you're out there taking photographs with, of trains particularly, you need to shoot them landscape. Now you can crop them later if you want to make them um, uh, for say an Instagram format or whatever. But the reality is, is that if you take your photographs of trains in landscape form, you actually find that what you end up with is that the format matches the actual subject. So where I'm coming at here is that trains are long. The subject is long. The subject is not a vertical subject. A vertical subject is a portrait uh, or a train coming directly towards you. Um, could be a, a portrait based um, could be a portrait based um, photograph, but the reality is the vast majority of train photographs should be taken in landscape mode. So please, that's a tip from a fellow photographer, um, and obviously these guys, John and his team, Graham and David and the other guys in this book, have shot the vast majority of their photographs in in landscape mode. Where does portrait work? Works for something like this one here, where in reality, um, you know, you're down here, uh, you know, you're down inside, um, you know, the engine cleaning area. A vertical format for that is just perfect. But that's a rare, rare occurrence. That doesn't happen very often at all. So, when you're taking your photographs, what these guys have done is use their 35 mil cameras. They've used them in landscape mode for the majority of their photographs. And the fact is, their photos are in books, and the guys that take all their photographs in portrait mode, they'll be on the on iCloud or Google Backup, and they'll never see the light of day because they really aren't all that much chop. So to sum up, Smoke, which arrived the other day, uh, you know, communication from John and his publishing team is absolutely first class. I can't recommend this book more strongly than I have because. Not only does it bring back imagery from a period that is long gone and will never, ever, ever be repeated, but as a serious modeler, the photographs in here are of reference standard. Little things like telegraph poles, you can see that there's, you know, there's three crossbars. So if you're modeling telegraph poles, you know that you need three. In this case over here, there's two. In this one over here, there's one. So depending on the area, you know, not all telegraph poles are the same. And in these three photographs, you can see you know, three different telegraph poles alone. Um, the other thing that these photographs show, particularly in New South Wales, is that less is more. In reality, some of us try to model and put too much on our layouts. These, these photographs really show that prototypically Particularly out in the country, you know, look at look here. I mean, there's an embankment and a paddock and, and a few a couple of trees and that's about it. Um, here's another one here, a paddock uh, and, you know, a little bit of a cattle race here and a little bit of an old fence, a little bit of spinifex type grass. A New South Wales modeler that does this probably better than anybody is a guy called Tim Preddy. If you ever have a look, search for Tim Preddy on YouTube or on Facebook. 
he gets this absolutely right. I don't think I've seen a guy that models um, New South Wales much better than him. Um, I've tried to model mine, you know, as best as I can, um, but yeah, you know, my modelling doesn't, you know, is not even as close to being as good as Tim's. So less is more sometimes. The other thing that's interesting to note too, before we finish up, is that you can see that these branch lines here, the track is not very high. So you can see that if you were going to reproduce that in HO, that you'd have to use something like code 70 or even code 83 at the best, but code 100 is just too big uh, for these branch lines. Out on the main line, you know, you can get away with code 100, but um, on branch lines like this, you can see that, you know, the track is probably that old 75 pound track, not the 108 pound a foot, which was what the main lines were made up. So I want to sum up this book and say thank you to John and the team. Um, this book is a worthy addition to the Kingsview Library, um, along with Shooting the West, which you know I thoroughly recommend. I don't know whether John's got any of these as left as well. I mean, again, another gorgeous book with lovely photographs, uh, you know, of a time gone by. You know, just just stunning. And Northern Exposures uh, here again, you know, really uh, prefacing and showing. Yeah, the main north, you know, lots of uh, photographs, uh, you know, on the main north. Um, these books, for me, are reference material that I've, that I've used to create the Kingsview Model Railway. So with that, that, uh, that finishes up our review. Uh, please like and subscribe if you like what we've done here today. A book review is something a little bit different, but um, what we wanted to do was to say thank you to John and and uh, at least pass on to him and his photographers um, how important these books are for modelers. So until next time, see you later.